Um, really excited to be here for this panel. Uh, my name is Jason Jay. I'm a senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management, um, director of the MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative, and um, I have the incredible privilege of getting to learn from our students as they um, have organized and, and collected this uh, incredible group of people together for today's event. Um, I'm furiously taking notes, and uh, and this is this is definitely the day of the year where the tables are turned in terms of uh, teaching and learning. Um, I'm really uh, happy to be hosting this, uh, this panel, which is on the theme of aligning local visions with global ones. And, um, and the way that, we, that we've constructed this is that we have um, three pairs of people, um, and each pair is, is sort of a, um, are, are working on uh, aligned issues. Um, and thinking about that both from the local solutions perspective and from the sort of scale up or replicate or global up, global or you know scale up the solutions in some capacity. Um, so the first pair um, is uh, Dimitri Booker and Gretchen Zucker. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to do sort of full bios for everyone. I'm, I'm hoping that when we when I invite you to tell your stories that you'll share a bit more of that uh, of that context. But Dimitri is the principal partner of um, an organization called Elevate, which is a full service, socially responsible, minority owned and vertically integrated commercial real estate firm um, that's working on some really exciting new real estate development projects, including a San Diego energy equity campus. Um, and, um, and Gretchen Zucker is um, part of the staff and leadership of Ashoka. Um, which is, as many of you may know, is an organization to support social entrepreneurs of various kinds and leaders, change makers all around the world. Um, and, uh, and she's currently working in a variety of different roles in impact investing um, as a strategic advisor to Ashoka now. Um, and then she is also involved in this real estate arena through a network of mobile home parks that are uh, women and, and minority led uh, commercial real estate team. Um, so that's sort of one of our pairs. Um, our second pairing is um, Ngozi Okaro and Celine Saman, who are here with us. Um, Ngozi is from the Custom Collaborative as executive director um, and advocates for a fashion industry that honors planet and people. Um, and this is a, uh, an organization that serves US designers who want to design and produce locally um, as well as workers in the space and consumers who want to who want ethical fashion. She's won a whole array of awards and recognition for her work in this space. So we're really excited to have her here. Um, and she's here with Celine Saman, who is the co-founder and CEO of Slow Factory, um, which is a, a 501c3 organization working in this environmental social justice intersection, um, particularly uh, driving uh, sustainability literacy and, um, and incubating new innovations in the fashion industry around sustainability. So looking at this, this fashion nexus. Um, and then the last pair, which we actually see in a single video frame here, uh, are Dune Lankard and Jim Smith, who are um, both connected to the Native Conservancy. They're joining us from Alaska. Um, just uh, Dune, you said it just a bit south of Juneau, I believe I got that right? Um, yes, in a small town of Cake. Great, great. So appreciate the, the widespread here. Um, both are uh, connected to the AOC communities in Cordova, Alaska, um, <clears throat> both involved in uh, subsistence and commercial fishing, and in some of the indigenous rights and uh, natural resource preservation efforts that surround that, uh, that context. Um, <clears throat> so we have, um, we have a lot to explore, a lot of voices here, a lot of really rich experiences in the room. Um, and so what I want to try to do is, is I want to sort of draw out these three um, ensembles, these three stories, um, and, um, and, and try to draw out the insights that you all have about this critical challenge of how do we take local innovations and bring them to a scale where they can make a dent on the big social justice and environmental justice and climate justice issues that are the focus of our conference today. Um, so um, we're going to start with kind of the basics of what you do, and then we're going to kind of pull back to um, the strategies that you've you know, that, that you've undertaken in order to get to scale, the challenges you faced at scale, um, and and the kind of the resources and so on that you've that, that that you've required, and that maybe you continue to require to do that. 
Um, and then see if we can draw some more general lessons from these individual experiences. Um, so um, let's start with uh, Dimitri and Gretchen. Um, let's start with just having you talk a bit about um, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Uh, Dimitri, maybe you can kick us off here. Um, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? Um, and what's the sort of theory or change or solution that you've brought to that problem? Yeah. First off, Jason, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this panel. Um, at Elevate Commercial, our, our mission is to be a change maker, be a leader in a community. Um, so often we work in communities of concern um, that lack certain resources um, from financial literacy to environmental justice. And, and so our, our role, our contribution to society is A, to be a face that's recognized within the communities, but also lead by example and expose our communities to these resources and opportunities. And so we wanna change the way people look at commercial real estate and housing in communities of concern. Okay, great. And, and, and so um, give, give me an example of what that, what that looks like. What, what, what's, the, what's the theory of change? What, what do the projects look like? Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's start, let's discuss our, uh, our SDEC project, which is a San Diego Energy Equity Campus. Um, San Diego, it's based in the city of San Diego. Um, energy, it's, it's, it's an emphasis on clean energy. It's the first net zero property built in San Diego. Um, happens to be a community of concern. Equity, um, it's about equity, uh, minority developers. Um, there's education opportunities for the children at the local high schools. There's career opportunities. And it's exposing a, a community to an industry that's emerging and growing fast. And that's the future. And then campus, it's a place of education and, and resources. And so we are building, again, the first net zero uh, development in San Diego. In addition to that, we're exposing a community of concern um, to this industry and also creating career and opportunities and also educational opportunities for the, for the local youth. Great, very, very cool. Gretchen, you wanna say a bit about the work that you're doing with the, that's in this, in this kind of, in a similar space? Yep, so how I, um, so I, did, I stuck Elevate next to my name also. So, um, so I've been with Ashoka for um, half of my career, um, more than half of my career, and uh, love investing and engaging social entrepreneurs who are doing amazing, um, innovative um, endeavors to solve problems that are at the root cause. And one of the challenges that I've seen is um, bringing in the, um, the financial capital that social entrepreneurs need to be able to scale their solutions. So not necessarily scaling their businesses or their organization, but scaling their solution. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so this is what Ashoka spends a lot of time thinking about. And um, so how my the Shoka work ended up intersecting with the Elevate work um, is for two reasons. Uh, the larger vision of Ashoka is this idea of everyone being a change maker. So we all have it in us to um, see a problem, devise a solution and bring about positive change uh, around us. And some do it in a small community, some do it at a much bigger scale. It, um, you know, it's really whatever your world is, that's the world that you're changing. And um, so I got really interested in another um, whole area of work of Elevate, which uh, are mobile home parks and our manufactured home communities. And when you think of everyone being a change maker, oftentimes these are the communities that um, are left behind in terms of the sense that you can take initiative, you can devise solutions, you can bring about positive change. And so that's just living out Ashoka's mission by working with these communities. Um, how that fits with um, environmental justice is actually, um, so the infrastructure of these manufactured home communities it, um, has also been left behind. The energy inefficiency in these communities is really bad. Um, so that's a whole other thing that we're working on from an environmental justice standpoint. Um, and really what we're about is equipping these um, communities to become change makers and owners of their own communities. Um, so how this fits further with Ashoka and social entrepreneurship is that this kind of impact investing that produces a financial return, but also creates impact, can also produce revenue to, to help uh, social innovation scale. So it's about the ut utilizing capital markets essentially to scale change. Okay, okay, great. Thank you, thank you, Gretchen. Um, let's go to uh, Ngozi and, and Celine uh, and the work that you're doing in the, in the fashion space. Um, could you share a bit about the problem that you're trying to solve and then you know what 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 your theory of change and, and solution set has has looked like for that 
And maybe Ngozi, we'll start with you. Yeah, thanks so much. Excited to be here and, and to learn and share and meet new people today. The problems that we're trying to solve, and I say problems, right, because there's more than one problem. There's one problem of environmental damage and environmental degradation. And then there's the other problem of human rights, uh, human rights violations and low wages, right? And so those actually in the fashion industry, those two problems really compound and make each other worse. And so just thinking about environmental justice, one of the things that we do at Custom Collaborative is make sure that the women, and it's mostly women, who make clothing and it's mostly black and brown women who make clothing that they understand and learn about um, environmental sustainability so they can be part of the conversation that is shaping their neighborhoods and their work. And uh, another thing is training people and making sure that they have the skills, um, in demand skills so they can do work at a um, you know, higher paid jobs, well paid jobs. So right, so we're advocating for fairness and equity in wages and in environment, as well as um, preparing people for work of today and work of the future. And I guess I didn't talk about custom collaborative, but I can do that a little bit later. But I want to, uh, I guess, transfer over to Celine because I think we're going to talk about a project that we did in 2020 that that we've been able to expand. Can I just ask you one quick question? Is there a geographic focus to your work, Ngozi? So right now we're in New York, in New York City. Um, okay. We would love to be broader, but but we're here and, and we're continuing to test and model things here in, in New York. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here with some familiar faces and new faces. And thank you, Jason, for having me. And thank you, Monica, for the invitation. And um, Big shout out to uh, Jade from the NDN Collective from connecting, for connecting us together today. We're very excited to be here. So similarly to Ngozi, um, my work is at the intersection of climate justice and human rights and um, in the fashion industry. But since the fashion industry touches on so many other industries like agriculture, waste, uh, import, export, um, oil, even extracting oil, um, we end up working across industries. And we've always started working horizontally across industries, which uh, is uh, the main focus for, uh, for our strategy. Our theory of change is essentially that uh, in order for us to achieve systemic change, we need to have a systemic understanding of what we are doing. And in order for us to do so, we need to understand as well that the systems that we've designed today are linear and they do not map out onto the natural environment that we're in, which is an ecosystem that is regenerative and circular by definition. So what we're trying to create is turning these linear systems into ecosystems, into circular systems, regenerative systems, interdependent of each other, interconnected. And so that is the work that we do behind the scenes, a lot of system thinking, system design, but also cultural like a cultural approach to things, uh, a product approach to things. Education is a big angle uh, in which we operate. Great, great. Um, let's go to uh, Dune and Jim. Um, can you share a bit about what, what are the problems that you're trying to solve and how are you going about it? Sure. <clears throat> well, you're all amazing, I can tell already. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I too want to thank Jade. Uh, she's come to Cordova a few times and she's now on our Native Conservancy board. And Jim and I had a wonderful conversation with Monica yesterday and she felt this made us feel very welcome. So thank you. And, uh, and your whole team, uh, we appreciate you even thinking about us and, and Alaska. Uh, what we're trying to do is, is figure out how we can continue our ocean way of life. And uh, both Jim and I, Jim is my nephew, uh, we're lifelong fishermen. All we've really ever known is the Copper River Delta and Prince William Sound. And a dear friend of mine uh, who's working with us on some of our cultural GIS mapping, Dr. Elizabeth Hoover, <clears throat> a professor at Berkeley, she said, how can you call yourself sovereign if you can't feed yourself. 
And in these times of, of hardship and, and uh, change on the ocean, we've had four crashed fisheries in a row. Uh, I got concerned. I felt like, you know, I could certainly keep fishing and fish till we catch the last one, uh, or we can <clears throat> come up with a solution. And our solution is to uh, start ocean farming. And so we want to uh, get kelp and mariculture farms in the water uh, for indigenous communities. And in talking with 36 different tribes across the state, uh, they want to get involved in the kelp space for three reasons in this order. One, for restorative purposes. So they can help uh, with conservation, restoration, and mitigation of our oceans. The second is they want to grow a traditional food source that we've been enjoying for thousands of years. And the third is they want to build a regenerative economy that relocalizes lost economies from the seafood industry and bring our women and youth back to the villages. So how we're going to do it is we're going to scale up by scaling down. So what we're going to do is we're going to work with these villages and communities to help give them the tools so they can uh, change their relationship with their food source and take care of their communities in this time of hardship and uh, be able to feed themselves and call themselves sovereign. Jimmy? <clears throat> Part of what I do is uh, I run a elder subsistence program and uh, it's kind of a small step, but a necessary step in uh, reclaiming our our rights to the fish and the kelp and the berries. Um, part of the some of the barriers that we face as native people is you the regulation, the fisheries, everything's kind of regulated just out of reach. For us, you, you can't really um, harvest our food if it's not in an industrial manner. So you have to have a big boat. You have to have, you have to be able to fuel it up. You have to be able to buy the nets, buy the stuff, and then you have to sell it. So the fish, everything else goes out of town almost. Get hops on a plane and heads out. Um, so part of, part of what I do is slowly trying to bridge that gap <clears throat> and bring, uh, not just bring the food back home, but the knowledge of how to harvest it, put it up, how to make your living off of that food. Because in my generation, it's, it, it's almost disappeared, that the knowledge. Um, I'm one of two um, commercial gillnet permit holders on, on the flats. There's two EAC permit holders out of 500. And uh, I've been trying for, since I was 18 to buy it, buy this permit, I'm 38 now. Um, so there's, there's a lot of bit barriers when it comes to management, when it comes to uh, also, uh, also kind of how they, they've set um, native people up against each other. <clears throat> so it's really nice to, to get spread out with these, uh, these other native communities and see that they're really, they're really kind of facing the same issues that, that we all are. And, uh, hmm. and uh, doing the restorative kelp farming is really kind of a catalyst in, in bringing us all together on that uh, on that front, and it's hmm. it's pretty wild. Thanks for that, Jimmy and and Dune. So, I, I, as I'm listening to each of you, um, there's a couple of uh, themes around scale uh, around this question of scale um, that are that I that I'm hearing across the different groups. So, there's one facet which is about the financing Gretchen you mentioned this which is you know if 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 there is if you can create mechanisms that are revenue generating that have some sort of you know some sort of positive cash flow that it might be possible to deploy capital impact investing capital that that you know to, to new sites 
and to at least scale the solution, if not scale the enterprise itself, right? Like maybe through kind of replication with other similar organizations. So capital and finance are kind of one bucket that we should talk about here with respect to scaling. Um, there's a second facet, which I heard, which is this kind of like, um, uh, and it's almost like scaling through education, right? Um, through through shifts in perspective. That if you know, Celine, you you talked about bringing a systems view, bringing a circularity and regenerative economy view, and if we can educate people in an industry, maybe across industries, in a new way of thinking, then that will catalyze people to instigate new, in a, you know, to get new things going, right? To get new efforts with. Um, uh, you know, maybe it's maybe it's with black and brown women who are producing clothing, as Ngozi described, or maybe in other contexts, we might find other places to do that. But education and awareness building are another kind of mechanism for scaling solutions that I think we we want to kind of bring into the conversation. Um, the third thing I heard was this very provocative phrase Dune used, which is to scale up by scaling down. Um, right, which is which is I think that this idea that there might be a set of you know skills and knowledge and practices to build at a local level that actually a, you know a whole variety of people could take part in. In a way, it's I, I hear an educational kind of theory there as well in the, the way you were describing, Jim, that the knowledge the knowledge of how to do this fishing is part of what's declining, and we have to rebuild that knowledge. It's a, it's a, it's, it's less of a conceptual education, like we heard with, with Celine describing as a, let's get our hands in the water, uh, you know, quite literally with planting this kelp and, and harvesting these fish. Um, and then the last thing I heard around scaling is about the regulation and the institutional context that surround us. That that sometimes the the public policy infrastructure around us is favoring something other than what we're doing. Like you described the fisheries regulation is designed for people who have boats and who are going out with nets and harvesting the fish and selling them into a market as opposed to a more traditional subsistence mo mode of engagement with the fishery. Um, and so if we want to scale up this other approach, you know, we some of that scaling may have to do with changing the rules of the game, changing the regulation, changing the policy. And, I mean, I could imagine that all of these elements, the financing element, the education element, the practice building element, the regulatory element are gonna be in play across all of these different examples. Um, but I wanna just dig in a little bit more on how you're using those kinds of strategies to, um, again, to, to, to multiply the impact of what you're doing, or maybe you're not, at that stage yet that's which is also fine i mean i think this i think this notion of scaling up by scaling down forces us to sort of like call into question this idea of scaling you know too quickly but um i'd love to hear you know maybe maybe oh we'll, you know dimitri Ngozi, if, if you how do you bring these different um tools to bear on you know, if you think about, and it goes, you, you mentioned that you guys are working in New York City. If we think about getting an approach to working with garment workers to, you know, I don't know, Bangladesh, right? The other side of the planet where we certainly see a lot of issues with labor and environmental impact of, or, 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 or Dimitri, if you think about getting your net sort of demonstration district of, in net, of net zero energy in San Diego to all of California, or it's a all of the United States, or you know, that's kind of what we need to have happen. How how do you think about that strategy for for rippling up? Um, so I just want to I will answer the question. I want to highlight something before we move further because I feel like we need to talk about two different ways of living in a way that has been superimposed on one way of living that then makes it almost impossible for there to be life. Right, so like Dune and Jim were saying, okay, we could fish this thing out until the last fish, and then there's no fish, there's no life in the ocean, we all die. The system that made the policy that you have to have a certain size boat and you have to have this amount of nets, that system was not created for there to be life. 
that system was created for maximum profit and not for the people who actually rely on the fishery, right? And so I think that when we're talking about scaling down to scale up, it's very similar to what Celine is talking about when she's saying, well, are we looking at a linear model which then burns everything to the ground, right? Or are we looking at a circular or regenerative model which gives us all an opportunity to still live? And so I just wanna make sure that people are hearing and understanding that there are two different sets of circumstances. And so for me, with my work, I recognize that I cannot change the economy, but I know that I can pilot and innovate and do some workarounds so that some people have a better opportunity of living a decent life. And then we can kind of forestall the rest of the devastation that's going on until we get some popular um, ability to change the system and save us all. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And that, that kind of systems change is exactly what we're after here, right? <laughs> that, I think that's why we are talking about scale. Um, mm. Yeah. Dimitri, yeah, Jason, and, and as far as scaling, first we look at access is, is first um, and, and, and to give more context. When you think of the Silicon Valley, you think of tech. And so um, starting with our project in San Diego, it's an area, it's a site that's been undeveloped, pad ready for 25 years. And so in order to move forward with a vision and a concept, first I have to give thanks to impact investing this project or any project of this scale wouldn't be a possible without impact investing that's why the site set vacant for 25 years but through uh, one of our key investors who who believe in the impact investing model andy ballister and kara who's a co-founder of gofundme this project became uh, feasible and so this creates what we look at silicon valley in san diego it creates an industry in a community of concern so now the community has access and so once a community have access to an opportunity or to a new direction, then you can focus on education and educating the community. And how do we put solar in everyone's home in the community? Um, how do you create careers in the community? All of our tenants for this site, including San Diego Community Power, are committed to hiring locally and doing demonstrations to make sure that not only the community have access, but now they have exposure and education and even opportunities and internships. So our, our method of creating scale is first creating an industry. So when you think of San Diego, you think of clean energy. When you think of the, the community, you think of access and opportunity. And then from there we can scale because it's not just the workforce, it's also the youth growing up and understanding this industry and being exposed to it. And then from there, we can grow and scale in other cities. And we're taking that concept and moving into our, our housing properties, whether it's manufactured housing or multifamily, because then the concept is how do you help someone in a community of concern or just in any community get access to solar or battery packs and even understand what that means, understands the value of having electric vehicles and how do they fund it and getting creative and saying, how do we use impact investing to create access first to these opportunities and resources and then from there we could scale with the education and the knowledge and then from there you grow a community. Gretchen, I, I wonder if you can say a bit about, you know, Ashoka as an organization has been in the business of, you know, supporting, celebrating, um, connecting innovators like everyone, like the other, like everyone on this call. Um, you know, what have you seen in terms of being able to take these local experiments, these local proofs of concept, these inspiring stories and, and getting them more, you know, getting them to, to, to get closer to that, to creating a new system to replace the broken system that doesn't produce life, to use Ngozi's language? Yeah. So I think, uh, Ngozi, can you repeat what this is to answer your question, Jason? And Gosu, you said popular, um, what was it, popular adoption? Popular, do you remember? I mean, it's possible said? that I said that. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure, right? <laughs> Shoot, but, I wish I'd written it down. <laughs> but I sorry. think where you were going is this idea that we all own the change. Um, and um, so that's exact. That's that mm -hmm. concept that we were talking about of everyone being a change maker. And until mm -hmm. we own that, is that we personally really desire 
um, not um, uh, fish, you know, fishing our fish out of extinction or um, uh, filling every landfill with throwaway clothing or what have you um, until we, that becomes um, um, a cause, a common cause. Um, so where, where have we had examples of that before? Um, the idea of women being able to vote, that was a crazy idea, right? Um, no one thought that that should be what we would adopt as a society. I think we can also talk about slavery too. That was something that was just totally given. We didn't think twice about it. Obviously some people thought twice about it, but generally as a society, it was something that was generally accepted or um, that gay people couldn't get married. That was something that was just accepted. Like why on earth would you change that? And then over time, society starts to think differently and you have a new paradigm. This idea of marriage equality became a new paradigm or um, women's suffrage became a new paradigm or racial equality became a new paradigm. And um, so that's, that at its root is what Ashoka is about, is helping us see a new paradigm and make that our own. So how do you do that is the next question. Um, and so a quick answer to that is that there are organizations that are super influential. Um, and if you can help essentially hijack those organizations and have common cause with those organizations, um, those forces, those societal forces, and that becomes their purpose is that paradigm shift, then um, you have way more um, kind of traction and influence than you would have if you're just doing this by yourself. So we saw this in the civil rights movement, we've seen this in the women's right to vote movement, we've seen this in marriage equality and other similar movements. And um, so that's actually the, a lot of the work that Ashoka is doing is finding these super influential organizations to partner with. You can imagine that school systems would be part of that, right? This is why everybody cares so much about school systems and what you do and don't teach in schools. So if you rewrite, there's a, I, this will give an example. There was an Ashoka fellow in Africa. I think she was based in Nigeria, but I don't remember for sure. She started rewriting all of the school textbooks to incorporate gender equality into the textbooks. So an example would be in a social studies or whatever, a, a health textbook, mom comes home from work and sits down when dad prepares, um, you know, while dad's preparing dinner. That would be, I mean, to have that be part of your textbook that school children are reading totally starts shifting your paradigm, right? So anyway, so that's an example of textbook publishers would be one of those societal forces that you can help influence. Uh -huh media companies and so forth. So that's kind of a theory, that's theory of change work. Jason, I was going to add to the list of things that we would scale and one would be talent. So this is why the sustainability conference is so important at, at MIT. Um, when I was, a, so I am an alum of Sloan myself. And when I was um, at school at Sloan, um, everybody was talking dot com. So it was all dot com all the time. And, you know, people were not, not necessarily going into banking and consulting. They were going to work for dot coms. Um, I would love to see the vast preponderance of students at Sloan and across MIT um, working for social entrepreneurs or becoming social entrepreneurs themselves. That's really what we need to be able to scale these, these solutions. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Sorry, one more thought about that. I think this is where I really have a lot of hope. Um, so our Gen Zers, I think we're Gen Z generally, or maybe some millennials who are um, students at Sloan also. Um, this idea of money first, I think is honestly starting to, um, to lessen. Like I don't think, so being a Gen Xer growing up in the 80s, it was money, 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 money. I mean, that was just life. That was the paradigm. That was what we thought of. That was normal to make money and making money first, as Ngozi was saying. I don't think that's so much the prevailing paradigm in this generation of students. And the more that we can see, huh, you know what? There's actually an inverse curve of happiness curve. The more money you make, the less happy you, you actually are. <laughs> Um, and there really are other things that we value in life. And let's start prioritizing that and building that into the fabric of what we do. Um, I think um, that's a big part of what we need to change. And I do think capital markets can change along those lines as well. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, June, I want to, and, and Jimmy, I want to come back to you here. So this, 
when I mean, I feel like part of what we're talking about here is, you know, if we if we think of if we look at you know, Dimitri's example, right? Where we're talking about a commercial real estate development and one that the regular market wasn't producing 25 years, the land laid, you know, kind of un, it, it, you know, underutilized. And then impact investing with a new paradigm comes in and allows it to allow something new to happen, right? And then we can think about, well, what are the other ways of sort of engaging that process? We talk about creating jobs and opportunities, but all of that is situated within a capitalist paradigm, right? It's all situated within like, let's build real estate, let's build, you know, energy economy, let's build jobs, let's build value. And I feel like, and there's a way that we think about scaling up technologies or scaling up new approaches that's very embedded within that way of thinking. And I, you know, you, you mentioned the dot-com boom, I mean, which I also sort of lived through, um, has that character. I feel like Dune and Jimmy, you're coming at this from a very different angle. Like where, where when you say scale up by scaling down and going from this kind of more commercial mode of fishing to the, to something that's more in this traditional or subsistence, or I don't, I don't know what word you would use, um, sufficiency or something like that. Like, is there, how can, how, how do you think about like, how do you think about scaling different than how we're thinking about it here? I mean, are we do, are we going to see kelp farms up and down the entire West Coast if we're successful with, or is this does this look different? Do you think about this differently? Yeah, <clears throat> um, that's a good question uh, because <clears throat> we too are concerned about uh, this emerging kelp and mariculture space uh, because not only is it coming to a shoreline near us? It's coming to a shoreline near you. And this is happening in Alaska and America and around the world. <clears throat> and what it equates to is a modern day land claims on the ocean. And so people really should be concerned about this because there's no plan, there's no regulations, <clears throat> there's no laws that uh, govern how to do this responsibly, let alone sustainably. And so what we're doing on our end is, is uh, we're fighting uh, for native rights. And, and it's like when the Black Lives Matter movement started rising up, you know, my initial feeling was, well, brown people matter too. And then all of a sudden, because of that movement, uh, the uh, with the incoming administration, all of a sudden, all this money for infrastructure, for build back better, for disadvantaged communities, accelerator funds, it's opened a, a floodgate of funding for uh, uh, communities, disadvantaged communities that would never receive that kind of money. But what we're going to do is, is we want to uh, actually uh, start a, a native kelp cooperative so we can uh, start uh, coopetition, uh, cooperatively competing against each other to get kelp in the water. Uh, but we also want at the same time to start a, a native kelp al alliance that is a 501c4 that's focused on, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to do programmatic permitting so we can do eight to 10 permits at a time instead of just one, because why we're doing it is for restorative purposes of the ocean. The other is, is we want to figure out how we can get CDQs, community development quotas for the surface of the water. So native peoples, uh, individuals, when it turns to limited entry and all of a sudden it has a three, $400,000 value, it's not gonna be sold outside of our community. We wanna figure out, how we can leave the kelp in the water longer and get the most carbon sequestration values we possibly can. Like we have all these carbon traders calling us right now. Well, we don't wanna do carbon trading. We wanna do carbon insets. We wanna be paid to sequester carbon. We wanna figure out how to do direct seeding and not have lines and buoys and anchors in the water. So we can figure out how to bring back our wild kelp for us and, and uh, uh, create habitat for 300 plus critters that make a living in the sea. And at the same time, as fishermen, like, you know, we've chased salmon and herring around our whole life. Uh, herring used to uh, be 50% of our annual income before the Exxon Valdez oil spill in 89. We haven't fished in 33 years. So um, 
if you have habitat and, and the herring are able to spawn on cleaner, colder uh, uh, kelp in deeper waters, uh, then hopefully they can rid themselves of this disease and they can recover. Because I'll tell you this, if the herring recover, the people will recover, all of the species will recover. So what we're trying to do is, is change the system by uh, actually uh, you know, allowing the original guardians and stewards of the land and the sea the opportunity to do this in a sustainable manner for regenerative and restorative purposes, not just making money. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's kind of a strange balance to uh, to be a part of. Um, the old man who taught me how to hunt on the water. He was really slow and thoughtful. There wasn't a movement wasted, you know. Um, but when it came time, it, you know, he moved quickly. But there's <clears throat> part of our organization has to move really fast, and part of it has to move really slow. And I think that's it's good to be aware of your speed at which you're traveling, because at a certain point you lose efficiency, you know? So it's, uh, mm. it's a strange balance for scale it, 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 in those senses. Yeah, so and you know, and I, oh, I'd like to just say one more thing on that, is success is really overrated. Like when, when we think about, you know, how um, we're gonna do this and, and how hard we're working and, and everything we're doing to, to mitigate, to regenerate, to preserve and protect. Uh, you know, we ended up saving a million acres of habitat over the last 30 years. Well, you have to preserve your subsistence way of life and learn how to grow things on the land and in the water if you're gonna survive. So protecting habitat isn't enough. And, and so, you know, I guess one of my messages is that, you know, if we're really going to, uh, you know, make a difference and create solutions, uh, we, we really need to figure out, you know, how to help each other, uh, you know, be able to succeed because there's a, a thousand global solutions that need to be funded and implemented immediately. I mean, everyone has to sit down and watch the movie by David Attenborough, A Life on This Planet. Everything's going to hell, people. Everything's is going, it, the end is near, we're facing it. And, and so climate change is real. You know, a lot of fishermen and native buddies of ours, you know, are in denial and, and still think that everything's gonna be okay. Well, you know, we're gonna have to, uh, you know, act faster. We're gonna have to, you know, step it up. And, and so what we're trying to do is just educate the people to change their relationship with the ocean and with their food source. And so we can be a part of a solution and not part of the problem. I, I, Jimmy, I'm really glad you brought in this, this, this notion of slow and fast. Um, I, I mean, Celine, your, your organization is literally called the slow factory, right? And yet we know just how extremely fast we have to act if we wanna mitigate this climate problem. Um, and so, but but it's sort of the the fast clock speed that sort of drives that dot com boom and the next thing and the next thing and the fast the, the capitalist machine, right? So, what is the what does the slow mean in the slow factory, and how do you think about holding the tension between this notion of slow and fast? That's such a great question. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, and again, to what Dune was saying, we have to scale down in order to scale up. Similarly, we have to slow down in order to have these solutions be implemented at scale. Slow factory means slowing down, degrowth. It started in 2008, actually. I never talk about the preface before we launched. From 20, 2008 to 2012, I was in deep research about how do we actually effectively slow down and 2008, 2007, that's when the iPhone became like really popular. Everybody was getting that phone and meaning that everything became on the top of our fingertips and everything started to go faster and faster, you know, click, purchase, you get it right away at, the, at your doorstep and then you can return it as fast as possible. 
and all of the work was also working around this notion of fast efficiency, fast efficiency. So the, the whole slow in the word of the slow factory means slowing down capitalism, slowing down colonialism, slowing down this oppressive system that is just extracting at a rapid pace. That's what we want to slow down. Okay, so a lot of times people are like, oh, slow factory, you're not working fast enough. That's not what that means. Um, <laughs> and often, even in the beginning from 2008 to 2012, we were criticized for using the word slow factory because you know, a lot of brands, a lot of people were like, I don't want you to slow me down. I want to go fast. And even till this day, this idea of slowing down is perceived as less than or, or where it should be the strategy. This is the strategy. We have to slow down. And to your question earlier, Jason, about scaling down or working from a small scale to a larger scale, uh, the project Ngozi and I worked on in 2020 was about that exactly to start from a small scale in order for us to grow to a larger scale because uh, oftentimes these solutions are overwhelming even to brands when we provide them with these solutions this is the solution custom collaborative is a solution you know um, they're like well how do we even scale it they immediately think about scaling it so in order for us to understand understand scaling we have to understand it at a micro scale and from that micro scale, what we worked on with, which was the one by one first science incubator in the fashion industry that the Slow Factory championed in 2020, was to pair a designer with a scientist. And in the case of Ngozi, social science was part of the program. And when we paired a designer with a scientist and provided them with a grant, we were able to observe innovation at a scale that we can all understand. And from that place, we can establish a frame, framework that can grow, that can scale, that can be implemented into the, the companies that are interested. And on that note, I'll pass it to Ngozi to talk about how she took that and scaled it. Thank you so much, Celine. Uh, the, the project that we did with Slow Factory in our social science uh, arena was providing the right inputs for fashion manufacturers to be able to bring on employees who had cutting edge skills that the, the companies needed. So one of the things that um, most of us discovered during the COVID early quarantine was that we were very reliant on overseas commerce and trade. And so then when that fell apart, businesses looked around and said, oh, I don't have these skills nearby, we need them. So what we did with uh, the support of Slow Factory and others was create a technical skills apprenticeship for women to learn technical design in fashion, right? Because if you're going to reshore, then all of the pieces need to be here. Uh, we, we scaled, we, we had that program. It was a, a six week program with three apprentices and we looked at it. We had, of course, had some hypotheses going in. We were able to test those to see what works, what doesn't work. And now we have scaled it into a larger nine month apprenticeship program that we just got some funding for from Chanel Foundation, right? But if we did not have that seed funding from Slow Factory, it would have been an idea and it would have been harder for others to buy in because it, they would think, oh, we just want this money to test something. So we were actually able to test it in the same way that you know the other projects tested some other types of like, um, building textiles from, from, from leather, I mean, uh, from fungus or bacteria. So it's really important that um, in order to do anything, uh, like, like James and Dune are saying, there's a thousand million ideas. We need to fund them all and test them, right? We can't spend all of our money sending people to the moon. We've already been to the moon. Let us seed some of these organizations like Elevate and do this work to, so we can see what our options are. Because you, you mentioned that the, the apprenticeship program started off with three apprentices in a six week program, and then you got Chanel Foundation. How many apprentices are in the new nine month version of it? Yeah, so we're actually launching it in April. 
Um, but we have enough funding that we can not only subsidize um, some of the apprentices um, pay, like, like we were able to do with Slow Factory, but then also reach out to bigger companies where we don't have to have subsidies. So well, we hope that we'll be able to have probably by the end of this year, 12 people in nine month apprentices. Cool. Nine month apprenticeship programs, yeah. And, and these are and these are these are skill sets that largely in the fashion industry right now are, are operating more in Vietnam, China, Bangladesh. We're sort of, you're sort of reshoring them here to the states. Reshoring, and the the fashion companies have told us that their um, their their staff, their employees are aging out. Right, so if people have been in this work for forty years, they're um, on the verge of losing these skill sets in the same way that we heard about with the fisheries, right? And so there are people who can do this work. We want to bring these people into the work at fair wages. We're, we're separately um, working on some uh, a pilot for a sustainability fellowship program, but that's, that's a, a different thing. But there are different areas in which we see we can make an impact. And so we have to pilot these things again to try them out. And so we see what works and then we can grow and then we can scale. But we need to have the runway, Custom Collaborative and all the rest of us on here, we need to have the runway and the time and the patient capital to do that. I mean, if we think about the this this um, energy equity sort of opportunity zone phenomenon that you've created in in San Diego, um, if you had to dream big, like would these be would there be a a project like this in every major city in the U.S. in every major city in the developed world, um, or is it? Or do you think it? Do you think the scaling up of the clean energy economy looks different in different places? Great question. the The goal is to lead by example and and have these projects or developments all across the U.S. and all across the globe. and And it's it's a it's a virtue of of, of being a, a leader in a space initially, and then sharing and collaborating with those like you on the call today. And and working together, so uh, the vision is is to be beyond San Diego, but to be worldwide. Mm -hmm. And 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 this tension that we're talking about between slow and fast, right? The fast part being we've got to scale up the clean energy economy, replace the fossil fuel economy as fast as we can to stop climate change from destroying a lot of what we we care about, right? Um, and yet, there's probably some things that you would want to put the brakes on for, right? Uh, you know, either either in the process, right? Like like you guys, Celine and Negozi just described. Well, first we got to figure out what it looks like for a one and one collaboration between, you know, to innovate around this before we go to the next step. Like, what are the things that force you to push on the brakes to do things right to be able to go faster later? It's it, I mean, it's going back to and I, and I love Celine and Negozi's uh, vision of you got to slow down or scale down and scale up. Um, so we we had to scale down and focus on what impact will we have on this with this development before we can scale nationwide, and and so it, the key is just really be hyper focused and saying what is the true impact you're going to have on that community or your tenants, what impact will they have on who they hire and what and what they do and, and educate, and so I, I so I think we're going through that process now and we're slowing down, being hyper focused, so we can actually scale up and and, and grow it and model this to, to be duplicatable. I see this a lot in the in this energy efficiency space uh, where where if you, you know, there's there's a whole, and, and it goes to the, this apprenticeship thing that Negozi is talking about as well as the sort of skill building that Dune and, and, uh, and Jimmy were talking about is that if you, there are, there's a new set of skills to develop here, right? If, if we if we could say we want to do energy efficiency retrofits of every building in Massachusetts, and we you know in one year or two years, right? But the reality is that the construction workforce to do that isn't there. Um, the HVAC contractors are not knowledgeable about electrification and air source heat pumps. So the um, you know they're, they're, and so the companies that have tried to move too fast in this realm have actually kind of overshot and collapsed and, and gone kaput because they, the quality of the service erodes really quickly if you can't build up the skill set of the people who 
um, you need to actually be doing the work. And, you know, similarly, it's like you said, uh, Dune, like you can conserve a million acres of land, but if you don't have the knowledge among the people of how to use that land and cultivate it and enact those traditional ways of engaging with the, 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 you know, the, the land's ability to sustain them, um, you're not going to get sort of the most use out of it. So th there is a way in which like these things have to go at their own pace, right? And there's a way in which, like Celine described, that we that that even the end point of some of the commerce we want to slow down. Like we want to slow down consumption. You want to buy the one high quality thing and hold on to it rather than the fast fashion, like 15 things that are going to go obsolete and use as much resources as possible for as little on the dime. Um, but I just, I just, and so I think that's like a reality of this whole movement around sustainability and regeneration is this need to slow down and this pacing ourselves. And yet, um, it's the, it's the pace of, of, of industrial, industrialization, and emerging markets, the pace of continuous adoption and replacement of technology that is driving the whole thing into, you know, kind of the problem that we have. So, you know, Ngozi, you talked about like the system that we've designed, the, the system, the existing system that we're trying to replace. If that thing's moving fast and furious and is always amassing more power and resources, but the new thing that we're trying to build has this character of going at the pace of, I don't know, life and the earth and human capability development, um, like, where have you, and for any of us here on the call, like where have we seen examples of where that has worked out right? Like, like where, where there's been maybe like a leapfrogging or a, you know, or some kind of, you know, crash of the fast, you know, the, the system that really has allowed something new to happen. And Gretchen, I mean, you described a couple of really important big paradigm changes, women's suffrage, marriage equality, abolition of, 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 certain forms of chattel slavery um but like in the current moment in the current moment what are the sources of hope for you about actually replacing the the fast linear system with the silver circular one yeah well so um uh i think what the work that Dune has done is a great example of this so part of uh, Dune's success is getting policy change and legislative change if I'm not mistaken, I think you were the you were part of the the, the movement to get the uh, billion dollar settlement with um, Exxon Valdez, right? Um, and these kinds of big um, groundswell of um, pushing for a change um, uh, that's that's what social entrepreneurs do. Um, and uh, when we think of you know we invested a lot as a as an American society in um, scaling up oil and gas, right? I mean, when we were first inventing the automobile, we didn't have gas stations everywhere. That had to be the government that decided, oh my God, we hugely need that infrastructure. So let's, you know, let make this a moonshot to um, develop the, um, the oil and gas industry and to um, build out that infrastructure and create all those jobs and train all those people to know how to refine gas. I mean, that, that didn't happen uh, because of just um, market forces. That also happened because of uh, government, right? So, you know, this whole idea of green jobs, I think finally people are starting to see, huh, wow, actually, you know, we could probably subsidize other, you know, green technologies. And, um, and again, I think universities play a huge role in this um, and, um, and policymakers play a huge role in this. It's not a crazy idea for us to continue to push for a carbon tax. That's not crazy. I have sat at um, American Enterprise Institute and listened to very conservative um, uh, uh, you know, pol you know, policy thinkers and policy leaders on why we need a carbon tax. I'm part of this group of, it's a bipartisan group that meets every quarter talking about a carbon tax. This isn't a crazy idea. This is actually totally doable. Um, and so the, you know, the last thing, so how did Dune get a groundswell of people to advocate for the, um, the, the legislative and policy changes and the and court decisions and so forth? Um, it's, by, it's by inspiring people to be change makers. So this is what really social entrepreneurs do is they cultivate mass populations of change makers who see that they have it in them to cause change. 
if you don't believe that you can change anything, then you're not going to step up and um, be part of this groundswell that we need. And so that has to be part of our education system. It has to be part of how we engage as landlords with our residents in our mobile home parks and so on and so on. Yeah, and, and I just want to piggyback on what Gretchen said earlier. Um, because what we're talking about in terms of, of climate and industry, it is something big, but we have done as people bigger things. And so um, my, my undergraduate degree is in political science. So I always think about the polity and about civics and people. And so I think about the, the number of people who in 1700 thought that slavery was bad. Well, for the most part, it was the people who were Africans who were stolen um, from Africa. And we have evolved as a country where one, slavery is no longer legal, right? And, you know, a few hundred years later, we had a black president. So then I contrast that with South Africa, right? And so just to think that Nelson Mandela was in a cell for 27 years. And then within years, he came out and became head of state. And so to my mind, part of what we need to do is to center the people who are most affected. And I think that that is black and brown people. And we need to listen to what they're saying about climate, um, indigenous people and their experiences. And that is what I'm saying when I, when I talk about popular adoption, right? We need to listen to the people who have the greatest stakes and also the most information. The people who are natives of Alaska know more and better about fishing than the wildlife and fisheries department. So th th these are the things that give me hope and, and make me say, I know that we can do this because we have done it before. And so if we center the people who we have pushed to the margins, I think we can figure this out and work and work quickly. Can I add one right other, <laughs> can, uh, sorry, one other small point. I think what we're also <laughs> feeling is a backlash against all of this change. So we're feeling this all the time, right? And you feel like every step forward, you take a half a step or more back backwards. Right, um, so you have a Black Lives Movement, and then you have a huge back, you know, backlash against that, and so on. It's happened with all of these paradigm shifts because it's scary. All of this change is super scary, um, but at the same time, um, I do, you know, I totally believe this whole, um, you know, the the whole the arc of justice is really, you know, it's we're getting there. We're moving in the, you know, on the whole, we're moving in the right direction. Um, I think we just can't lose faith that change is coming. Um, um, and the more that we can instill this idea of we are capable of, of being part of that change, that we can, we can be part of it, we're not threatened by it, we can actually contribute to it. Um, I think the less that that backlash will lessen. I think a lot of people are also just honestly feeling left behind. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, and that's scary, too. So I wanna, you wanna... oh, yes, I want to jump in very quickly to just again, piggyback on what Gretchen is saying regarding empowering the next generation of change makers and just going back a little bit to narrative changes and cultural changes that you were mentioning and the role that, you know, for us at Slow Factory, we see it as like injustice is by, by design, pollution is by design. It's designed this way. It's not just happened to be, uh, you know, like this. And so we use design as a way to really shift these narratives, design, visual design, it could be system design, it could be experience design, and all this um, uh, field of research around design to really empower the next generation, as you were saying, for instance, education is for us part of design because we have to translate it to the general public. We're taking like really complex situations, issues, concepts, and bringing them back to uh, the public, changing the public discourse also impacts what Dune was saying regarding policy, because policy follows culture. And so policy change also needs the support of the public. And how do we get the support of the public? It's not just through doom and gloom and everything's going to collapse and we're all doomed. It's going to be the end soon. 
there's so many research out there that have proven that this type of, of messaging is actually disempowering. It's actually taking the public away from these solutions, away from feeling empowered that there are things that can happen. And when we look at things as such a large scale, there is a feeling of, oh my God, I'm so small. There's no way I'm gonna be able to do anything about it. And so that's why the next generation, what we call the Gen Z, is definitely confused about what is it that you're expecting me to do here, given that look at what you've done, you know? So those are the folks that we're talking to at the Slow Factory and the opening of our school recently in, in New York, we're opening a 20,000 uh, square feet school a climate school in Brooklyn, we have about 25,000 students. They're all Gen Zers, basically. We're lowering the bar to entry on these topics. And what you were saying earlier, Gretchen, as well, is that all these engineers and designers and creatives that are working in other fields, most of the, most of the time contributing, upholding these systems of oppression, we want them to work in the field of climate justice and human rights. So climate justice and human rights, it's not just policy and a very um, austere group of people that are meeting for groups of changing laws and whatnot. It is about opening the, the doors to creatives, to artists, to designers, to engineers, to uh, thought leaders, because we need to be able to use, you know, design thinking, creativity, community, as you were saying earlier as well in Gozi, community when we say let black and brown and indigenous people lead okay that's how we allow to lead because we need to provide skills and provide um, this advantage so lowering the bar to entry to all of these topics on whether they are material sciences or policy change they need to be able to be free accessible open to all and so I feel like it's a little bit of everything it's like a little bit of all of these solutions that we're discussing at the same time simultaneously need to be happening. So again, there's nothing slow about that, but that's what we need to slow down is the business as usual. That's what we need to slow down. I, I, I mean, I, I, the, the, this, maybe this is a little like provocative, but I, I think that the, what I'm hearing you all say is that the change, the real scale, the, the real system change here is a change in the cultural paradigm uh, in a popular movement that's supportive of public policy change that changes the rules of the game that has us operating in a completely different way, right? And in that context, um, you know, I, I when, when I signed up to moderate this session or, you know, got volunteered um, by our, our, our students here, you know, I, it was framed as, you know, how do you take local solutions and scale them up, right? And I think that's very much the sort of like, it's very much the sort of entrepreneurial private sector innovation kind of way of thinking, right? Which is let's make something and make it be so successful and so awesome that we're going to want it everywhere. And then that thing will replace the thing that we have, right? Um, but part of what I'm hearing is that like, maybe the role of some of these more radical innovations in sustainability is to fail, um, is to fail beautifully, um, is to fail and in failing reveal the broken system that surrounds them. It's, I have this image of like, tr of like growing, a, a, trying to grow some beautiful flower and then seeing the flower and then seeing the flower die because the soil around it is polluted. And then you realize you have to solve the soil pollution problem if you wanna actually grow the flower. Um, that, that in fact, like, and I, I'm taking this to an extreme here, but there's a way in which the role of these innovations, these proofs of concept, these local um, you know, programs is to showcase a new way of operating, which we actually don't even intend to be able to be successful in the current system, because we know that policy, we know that a carbon tax, without a carbon tax, we're not gonna sufficiently reward any of these carbon sequestration mechanisms like kale farming, right, without, um, you know, without a systematic approach to bringing black and brown people into the power structure and having their voice, we're not going to emphasize the job training and, and empowerment of, of these, um, you know, uh, focal communities. Um, and so it, they, they, they dramatize, there's a role here for sort of dramatizing the need for a policy change and a cultural change. Um, I mean, obviously, I want to see all of your efforts be successful and sort of grow. And I think we should recognize, like, 
when it's their when their purpose is to show how they bump up against a system that needs to be changed and then have that be our emphasis in building a movement for that kind of policy change i mean i feel like what you're saying is not provocative i think that what you're saying is that social entrepreneurs should be given the same latitude and the same support and the same success expectation rate as silicon valley or all these other venture capital mm -hmm. funded businesses like, I think that's a, that's what you're saying. And right, one in I, 10, right? Yeah, I mean, I fully agree with that. But I, I would also say going back to scaling, I think that the idea of scaling and putting here, there, and everywhere might not be the right thing because I know what makes custom collaborative work in New York. I don't know what would make custom collaborative work in San Diego. So I would imagine that we would need to modify if we were going to San Diego or going to the small town in Alaska. I'm sorry, I forgot the name. I know it's not Huno, right? That we would need to work right with the local partners, right? So there are some things that we can lift and say, here's a template, but we also have to listen deeply to the community in figuring out what will work for them and in their individual circumstances. So again, scaling has its place, but we also have to first test and grow and then listen. There's a word called glocalization, which I don't know if you guys are, it's like someone said co-opetition earlier, right? It's like this notion of being more place-based in the way that we think about that. Um, Dune and Jimmy, I heard from you a little bit, and I want you just to, to um, off, you know, what, what in this conversation gives you hope? What, 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 what do you walk away from here that gives you some light and some energy to fuel your, your to fuel your work at whatever pace and scale that you want to achieve it. Um, I, I, I just really love what Rosie's saying. Um, it, it makes me feel a lot better about moving forward because I think you know, <clears throat> organizations that that fund um, people like us, they they really need to just trust our process and our local knowledge and uh, the speed at which things move. Um, and it also gives when that happens. Uh, in in my case at least it's like i i spent my life uh tying knots and building fishing gear and uh basically that's that's what i'm good at and native conservancy being funded gave me the opportunity to make change with what i'm good at which you know it it, it gives people the opportunity to make real movement forward with whatever they're good at. If whatever you're good at, you can change the world. You just need the opportunity. You need the, the trust from, you need the trust in your, your time and your knowledge of how things work where you're from. So, yeah. And that, and that, and that yeah, and I, I guess, Sorry, are we, we, we? Let me just one second, June. Are we? Are we run? Are we out of time here, Sherry? Or do we? Are we, can we have a couple? One more minute. Uh, yeah, um, we should we should end at uh, fifteen till two okay. fifteen. Yeah, okay. so, so we have a couple more seconds. All right, June, you, June, June, you get the last word here, buddy. <laughs> well, <clears throat> hearing all of your stories gives me hope, and you know, and I. Uh, I like to inspire the youth and, and create hope. And so I gave my thousand day notice. And, you know, as, as uh, uh, Gretchen said, you know, we want to scale the talent by giving them the opportunity. And so by me putting in my thousand day notice, I'll be, I told them, Jimmy, I said, you know, I'm not going to be far. I'm going to be on channel 23 on the VHF in Simpson Bay moving at seven and a half knots. So I'm gonna be slowing my life down, but I'll still be able to push the envelope, 
you know, the legal, the media, the legislation and direct action when need be, because we are the change makers. So we're gonna to have to be louder than everything else, but we can still remain a voice of reason. And, and I just, you know, wanna end it with this quote from my friend, Michael Bazanson, who started the organic food program for Whole Foods USA. He said, if it's not regenerative, then just don't do it. And that's how we have to live if we're gonna help save the planet. And I'm just absolutely honored to be in this circle with you all and look forward to working with you all in some way. So come visit us up in Alaska and let's go kelpin. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much to the summit team for pulling together another great panel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you all. All right, Gretchen, let's talk. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.